coordinate that. Good morning. <laughs> you can be seated. And good morning to our viewers online as well. So this week we're finishing up our series, uh, The Spirit and the Mission of the Church. Next week we'll begin a new series on the, the book of Psalms um, that, we'll go th that we'll go throughout the summer. Uh, the series will be called Psalms, Authentic Worship. Um, why authentic worship? Um, because in the Psalms, really, we find the whole spectrum of human emotion. Uh, we'll primarily be looking at the Psalms to explore how we can authentically worship and pray to God, right? Just getting everything out in the open before him. Uh, but we'll also explore what it means to be our authentic, authentic selves with each other. So, so a summary to bring us up to speed on today's scripture. Uh, during the 40 days after Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to his disciples several times and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Uh, he told them to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, then Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came with great power. Peter then preached and 3,000 people were baptized and joined the church uh, in one day. Then Peter healed a man who had been crippled from birth and used the opportunity to preach the gospel uh, to all the people who had gathered there to see the miracle. And in today's scripture, in Acts 4, uh, it begins with a confrontation. Peter and John are speaking to the people and they're confronted by the priests and the leaders and the Sadducees because those people are disturbed by Peter and John's teaching. So disturbed that they arrest them and throw them in jail. Um, this is the first instance we see of suffering and persecution in the book of Acts. Suffering and persecution, of course, will become the hallmark of Christianity. Uh, it begins with Jesus, then with the disciples, Paul, first century church had its share of martyrs, continuing all the way to present day. We'll get to that in a bit. This shouldn't come as a surprise though. Uh, Jesus had warned his disciples that suffering and persecution was coming. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? The slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me. For they have rejected the one who sent me. So I call today as a message, suffering and persecution. Um, things that we generally tend to want to avoid, right? We usually don't want to talk about them. Suffering, for instance. No one enjoys suffering. Um, most people around the world, however, realize that suffering is just part of life. If they're Christians, then they realize suffering is part of living in a fallen world. Um, here in the US, uh, we can tend to take things for granted. Things like safety, comfort, convenience. So much so that if we don't have those things, it almost feels like our basic human rights are being violated. And this kind of thinking has even uh, affected the church. One of the misconceptions common in Christianity, in, in the, particularly in the U.S., is that if you become a follower of Jesus Christ, God will make your life easy. So the most extreme example of this kind of thinking would be the teaching of uh, what's sometimes called a prosperity gospel. Um, that it is God's will that Christians be, always be wealthy, healthy, and happy all the time. Um, and that there is always a direct correlation between following God's will 
and how prosperous a person is. Never once considering that if we look in the book of Acts, if we look throughout the history of the church, many times God's will wasn't that someone would be prosperous or wealthy or even healthy. It was that they would be martyred. That believers would suffer and even die for their faith. Um, Even those who wouldn't say that they are prosperity gospel people, there's this unspoken idea that God somehow promises to protect them from suffering and persecution. Um, This can result in believers uh, who are going through suffering questioning God, questioning themselves. What am I doing wrong? How am I responsible for this? Or worse, why would God do this to me? Does he even really love me? And eventually this can lead to a crisis of faith where people just walk away from their faith in Jesus altogether. Bad teaching on the theology of suffering is why this can happen. or not teaching on suffering at all. Unfortunately, the Bible regards suffering as normal, uh, both for Christians and non-Christians. Of course, we live in a fallen world. Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and the world itself was subject to corruption and decay. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 22 says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So as a result, uh, there's sin, there's sickness, there's disease, there's pain, there's suffering, and there is death in the world. Um, Mason talked last week about the kingdom of God, that it is here, but it is not yet fully here. That the kingdom of God, this future reality of the kingdom of God was inaugurated And it broke into the present when Jesus died and was resurrected. But it will not be consummated until Jesus uh, comes again. The future reality of that fullness of the kingdom of God, we won't see until Jesus' second coming. Which means, for now, uh, we see evidence of that future reality breaking in when we see salvations, we see healings, we see miracles and such. But again, we won't see an end to evil and suffering and death until Jesus returns. If you're up on the news, um, you know that just this past week, we saw another school shooting, this time in Texas. 19 students and two teachers killed. The week before that, uh, there was a grocery store shooting in Buffalo, New York. Ten killed, three injured. And of course, there is a war going on still over in the Ukraine. Since Russia began invading Ukraine in February, um, over 4,000 civilians have been killed, including nearly 200 children. So there is pain and suffering and death happening all around the world. Um, As a pastor, I've seen death on several occasions. I have stood uh, by, on the be- by the bedside of people who were passing from this world to the next. It's not as big of a deal, but just this past week, uh, we had to have our little beagle, Barney, put to sleep. He had, he had like cancer all in his nasal passages and I think like moving down into his leg and just throughout his whole body. It's true that God 
in his mercy, does protect us many times from pain and suffering. Um, It is true that God in his mercy still heals and he still does miracles today. But still, suffering is a normal part of life in a fallen world. We live in the tension between what is and what is to come. Not only that, but for us as followers of Jesus, the Bible actually promises that we will be persecuted and suffer for our faith. Sometimes we forget that Satan is still the ruler of this world. It's in John 12, 31. It says, The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. Which means the world right now is still in rebellion against God. It hates God. And so when the Son of God, Jesus, came in the flesh, the world responded by murdering him. Jesus promised us that the world would treat us the way that it treated him. Suffering and persecution have been the hallmark of Christianity from its very beginnings. First Jesus then the apostles, then all those martyred in the first century church continuing on to this day. It is estimated that there are over 100,000 Christians each year who are dying for their faith in Christ. Most of us find, uh, find this hard to believe, but the ability to worship Jesus without fear of persecution, right, in the comfort of a secure climate-controlled church is unknown by the majority of the world's believers. But that is changing. Um, As a country, you may have noticed that we are increasingly moving towards being post-Christian, even anti-Christian. The British theologian John Stott uh, pointed out this. He said, Persecution is simply the clash between two irreconcilable value systems. So that clash is what we're seeing right now. And the clash is ultimately between those who believe, who trust, and love the God of the Bible and those who don't. This is a huge change from even just a few decades ago. As Christians, regarding the culture, the wind is no longer at our back It is in our face, right? The idea of suffering and being persecuted for our faith in Christ here in the U.S. is no longer unthinkable. There are some who are confused by this. There are some who are frightened by this. Uh, But author and professor Gene Weith says this. He says, one of the greatest paradoxes in Christian history is that the church is most pure in times of cultural hostility. When things are easy and good, that is when the church most often goes astray. When Christianity seems identical with the culture, and even when the church seems to be enjoying its greatest earthly success, then it is weakest. Conversely, when the church encounters hardship, persecution, and suffering, then it is closest to its crucified Lord then there are fewer hypocrites and nominal believers among its members. And then the faith of Christians burns most intensely. Today in many parts of the world, especially uh, in Islamic and communist countries, being a follower of Jesus uh, means at best losing your job, being rejected by your family. At worst, it can mean imprisonment, it can mean beating, even death. These things are being experienced all over the world right now by our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we could begin to see this kind of suffering and persecution happen in our lifetime right here in the United States. So let's talk about suffering a little bit. Fun topic, suffering. But we need to. Let's talk about suffering from a biblical and theological viewpoint. Um, Some of the best biblical teaching I know of on suffering uh, comes from Martin Luther's teachings on the theology of the cross. 
Martin Luther King's that guy who broke from the Catholic Church, was primarily responsible for the Protestant Reformation. Um, according to Luther, the cross of Christ is not only the means by which God saves the world, but it also establishes the paradigm for how God works in the world and in our own lives. So what do I mean by that? It means that contrary to what many of the prosperity gospel people would tell you, God is most active in our suffering, in our weaknesses, and in our failures. Um, in general, everything we don't think of, when we think of the words beautiful and glorious and every other majestic descriptive word we can use to describe God. Luther goes uh, so far as to say God can only be found in suffering and the cross. Um, if you've been a Christian for a while, that idea might seem crazy to you, right? Of, of course God can be found in other places, right? Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Romans 1.20 says, forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. So Luther acknowledges that God can be known apart from the cross. He just thinks it's dangerous. Here's what he says. Now it is not sufficient for anyone and does him no good to recognize God in his glory and majesty unless he recognizes him in the shame and humility of the cross. In other words, it is dangerous to try to relate to God as beautiful and majestic and glorious before we relate to him as crucified. It is dangerous because there's no reason to suppose that a majestic God would be a friend to sinners like us. Um, ancient civilizations, they imagined their gods um, loved only the noble, the well-born, the virtuous. Uh, this is the exact opposite of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news for those of us who don't measure up. Another danger is that we will miss out on much of what God is really doing in the world. If our only lens for seeing God move is through the lens of glory, right? meaning we only see God moving when we see healings and we see miracles and we see powerful answers to prayer, then we're missing out. Now, don't misunderstand me. I love to see healings. I love to see miracles. I believe that God still heals today. I know that he powerfully answers prayers. But if that is the only lens through which we see God moving, then we are missing out. In particular, God works through suffering. He works through our sickness, and he works through our pain. He builds things that are important to himself through our worst failures. He works through the lamb being led to the slaughter as much as he works through the lion of the tribe of Judah. When we learn to recognize God in this way, then we can also learn to recognize God in his glory and his majesty in a way that actually does us good. If we start with glory, though, the cross will in one form or another take on secondary importance in our thinking and feeling about God. But if we start with the cross, then our understanding of God's glory will be tremendously deeper and richer and in the end more glorious. So over the course of this sermon series, uh, we've been exploring how the Holy Spirit empowers us to accomplish the mission of the church. All right, we use Jesus' commission 
in Acts 1.8 as, as sort of our guiding scripture. Uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We've talked about how the Spirit empowers us to continue Jesus' mission of making disciples. Um, people who, without Jesus, have no hope, either now or in eternity. And that making disciples um, essentially has four components, upward, inward, outward, and forward. Right? Upward is how well we're loving God. Inward is how well we're loving each other. Outward is how well we're loving the lost, the last, and the least. And forward is how much we are pouring into, mentoring, uh, discipling people so that they can then go do the same with others. Last week, Mason talked about how the Spirit empowers us to both proclaim the kingdom of God and to demonstrate it. And here's where I want us to land uh, in this sermon series. It's interesting. I've been uh, on staff at Life Church and living here in Fergus Falls for 14 months now. I've come to realize that while the people here are genuinely some of the nicest and the friendliest people I've ever encountered, um, I've also realized that almost everyone I've encountered is quietly dealing with some kind of suffering. They've either experienced trauma and suffering and are dealing with the aftermath of that, or they are currently experiencing trauma and suffering, and they're right in the middle of it, dealing with it. And what I've come to discover is this. The church entering into people's suffering and trauma is probably the greatest mission field of the 21st century. What do I mean by that? Trauma occurs when suffering becomes so bad that it overwhelms our ability to cope with it. Um, it can be sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, spiritual abuse. It can be mental illness. It can be a debilitating physical condition or a disease. Uh, trauma can be due to domestic violence or child abuse or trafficking. It can be violence due to criminal activity um, or due to living in certain parts of the city. It can be a refugee who's experienced trauma because they've lived in a war zone. It can be a veteran who's suffering from PTSD. Trauma can be experienced by the elderly who are dealing with the loss of mobility, they're dealing with the loss of independence or the decline of their mental faculties. Trauma can be experienced by the caregiver of that elderly person um, who is overwhelmed and who's on the verge of burnout. People who have endured suffering and trauma live with recurring memories of things they've had to live through and endure. It can affect their sleep. It can destroy their relationships. Um, it can destroy their capacity to work. It can torment their emotions. It can even impact their faith. And all of this is invisible. We may not see it, but we see the effects of it. And the people all over, people all over are waging private battles of personal suffering. So what does this mean for the church? Do we just focus on the glory of God and ignore the cross? Of course, we keep praying for healing. We keep praying for miracles. 
We pray again and we pray again if we need to. But I'm talking about also following our Lord's example of incarnational love. Suffering and trauma is an opportunity for the church uh, to bend down like our Lord Jesus bent down for us and enter into suffering with love and practical help, companionship, comfort. The church is called to bring light into dark places. The church is called to love broken and damaged people. The church is called to bring the truth about who God is. That Jesus entered into our world, into our humanity, and into our suffering. So that we might know him, be reconciled to him, and be saved and restored in every way possible. Suffering is a call for God's people to become like our Savior, who was and who is love. When we do that, it often opens the hearts of people to the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Incarnational love. It is coming alongside people. It is matching their pace. It's comforting them. It's praying for them. It is being fully present with them in the midst of their pain. So even uh, when it's under good circumstances, like when we get married, um, entering into the life of another person can be challenging. Right? For example, if you want a good marriage, you obviously cannot be the center of your life. Right? Where there was one, now there are two. Uh, You used to play a solo, now you play a duet, right? And learning that duet, uh, as any of our marriage ministry team members will tell you, uh, requires a good deal of listening and understanding and patience. It means laying aside our preferences. It means sometimes laying aside the ways of our family of origin. Uh, It means laying aside our little must-haves so that we can learn to know the other person so well that we can love them the way that they need to be loved, right? not the way we want to love. When we see this done well, you've seen this before. When we see this done well, it's a thing of beauty. Entering into someone else's suffering uh, is very similar. So it's Memorial Day weekend. Um, Think of walking alongside a tormented vet, veteran. They have pictures in in their head like you wouldn't want to see on TV, right? Let alone live through yourself. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe they don't trust easily. Maybe they don't think clearly. And that's not likely to change anytime soon. It's the same with someone who's suffered abuse. Human beings can't suffer things they were never meant for and then just bounce right back. Right? This requires incarnational love. It requires a long, steady obedience to Jesus and to his way of loving and living in order to walk with people who are suffering or who have suffered. We don't do it so that we can feel good about ourselves. We don't do it so we can have a good story to tell. We do it out of humble service to those suffering people because Jesus demonstrated humble service to us. So when we refuse to enter into people's suffering Um, we are actually aligning, if they have one, with their perpetrators. We are aligning with the person who caused their suffering because they saw their victims as insignificant and unworthy. We also abandon Jesus 
because that's where he went and that's where he still goes today. We've heard a lot in church about spiritual warfare, um, equipping God's army to do battle against the evil one. Certainly we do that with prayer and with faith and with the word of God and all of the other um, armor and weapons that are talked about in Ephesians 6. We also do battle with the dehumanizing nature of illness and suffering and tragedy. Um, in addition for praying, in addition to praying for that future reality of God's kingdom to come upon this person in a miraculous way, we need to give respect and honor and dignity to, to these people because they were created in the image of God. Now, no matter how cloudy that image becomes, that image is still there. Even when a body is so broken that it is entirely dependent upon someone else's care, even when their mind is basically gone, um, we are called to give dignity to what remains because that person was still created in the image of God. When we are the one suffering, uh, the enemy would have us think that if we'd loved God more or if we'd done things differently, we wouldn't be suffering. When we encounter suffering in others, the enemy would have us treat them with impatience or disgust, or at the very least, distancing ourselves from them. There are many followers of Jesus who are bathing sick bodies. Uh, there are many followers of Jesus who are emptying bedpans. They're smiling at faces that no longer recognize them. Um, they are entering into people's suffering and they are caring for someone else's throwaway child. They're doing battle against the ravages of disease and suffering and tragedy. And in the process, Jesus is being glorified. If you've been around suffering people, uh, whether it's someone who's full of cancer or they're battling like some kind of chronic pain, you know this. Suffering reduces a person. Um, it lessens all their capacities, and not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, relationally, spiritually. Um, they become less of themselves. That's just as true for unseen wounds as it is for physical diseases. It's true for the combat vet, for the rape victim, for the incest survivor or someone dealing with a family member who has an addiction. They may look fine, but their wounds run deep and affect them in pretty profound ways. If we try to enter into the life of someone who is reduced or limited or altered by their suffering, we have to reduce ourselves as well. That's why we're quiet in a hospital room. When we are practicing the ministry of the presence, right? We're being fully present to those who are suffering. We use fewer words, we quiet our voices. We try to be more patient, right? We don't wanna, we don't wanna overwhelm them. We don't wanna cause them more harm. Um, when we do that, we are following Jesus' example. We are following Jesus' example, who says in Philippians 2.7, 2, gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. He significantly reduced himself from his eternal glory so that he could enter in and become like us. So it is Christ-like to reduce ourselves in the presence of someone else's suffering. 
when those who are suffering are slow to speak or they're slow to listen or slow to change. Um, our response to them should be to be like how Jesus responds to us. Right? He is patient, he's long-suffering, he's merciful, he's compassionate. We incarnate the presence of Jesus Christ to those who are we are with them. It's interesting. God is always working from both directions. Um, we're not just being present with them and trying to incarnate Jesus' love to those who are suffering. Um, God is also showing us where we are not like him. Right? Many of us fail miserably at trying to be Christ-like to people. Right? I know I do, many times. But God shows us where we are not being like him so that we can run to him and have him teach us how to become more like him. Right? Of course, we are called to be more like Christ. But when we fail, and we will fail, it's an opportunity to go to Jesus and have him change us. Typically, when we go through painful situations... We want to change the person, or we want to change the circumstances, right? So, for example, um, try to get our spouse to change, or our coworker to act differently, right? Maybe, maybe we'll even pray that the Lord would change their heart. Or we'll pray that the situation that we're in would just miraculously change. And sometimes the Lord works miracles. Um, but sometimes he's wanting us to get on our knees before him. And then he begins to teach us some things. Like what that situation or that relationship has revealed about us. And it leads us to pray that God would give us more of himself. More of his grace, more of his patience, more of his love, his mercy, his compassion. So that. We can better represent him to others, right? Even the ones we feel are the hardest to love or who might never change, right? Truly, if we are to be empowered by the Spirit to accomplish Christ's mission for Life Church, then we need to be a church who enters into people's suffering and trauma and brings the presence of Jesus. We need to bend down like Jesus did with us, right? And enter into people's suffering with love. Loving, broken, and damaged people. Bringing light into dark places. We need to do this with each other. We need to do this out in the community. And we need to do it out in the world. Suffering is God's calling for his people to become like our Savior and love well. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and we want to confess to you that we have not loved as well as we should have. We confess to you that in the face of suffering, we often feel inadequate. We know, God, that you are God who still heals and does miracles, and we continue to pray for those things. Sometimes we see those things happen and we rejoice, but many times we continue to see pain and suffering and tragedy and death. God, help us to be a church who enters into people's suffering and trauma and brings the presence of Jesus. Help us enter into people's suffering with love. Loving broken people. Bringing your light into dark places. So we can better represent you to them. Lord, even the ones who 
who because of their brokenness are the hardest to love or who we think might never change. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.